Lesson 7 Sharing the Word Sabbath Afternoon August 8 Men have been unwearied in their efforts to obscure the plain, simple meaning of the scriptures and to make them contradict their own testimony. But like the ark upon the billowy deep, the word of God outrides the storms that threaten it with destruction. As the mine has rich veins of gold and silver hidden beneath the surface so that all must dig who would discover its precious stores, so the Holy Scriptures have treasures of truth that are revealed only to the earnest, humble, prayerful seeker. God designed the Bible to be a lesson book to all mankind in childhood, youth, and manhood, and to be studied through all time. He gave His Word to men as a revelation of Himself. Every new truth discerned is a fresh disclosure of the character of its author. The study of the scriptures is the means divinely ordained to bring men into closer connection with their Creator and to give them a clearer knowledge of His will. It is the medium of communication between God and man. The Great Controversy, page 69 As the plant takes root in the soil, so we are to take deep root in Christ. As the plant receives the sunshine, the dew, and the rain, we are to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. The work is to be done not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. If we keep our minds stayed upon Christ, He will come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. As the Son of Righteousness, He will arise upon us with healing in His wings. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. We shall grow as the lily, we shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine. Hosea chapter 14, verses 5 and 7. By constantly relying upon Christ as our personal Savior, we shall grow up into Him in all things who is our head. Christ's Object Lessons, page 66. The water that Christ referred to was the revelation of His grace and His Word. His Spirit, His teaching, is as a satisfying fountain to every soul. In Christ is fullness of joy forevermore. Christ's gracious presence in His Word is ever speaking to the soul, representing Him as the well of living water to refresh the thirsting. It is our privilege to have a living, abiding Savior. He is the source of spiritual power implanted within us, and His influence will flow forth in words and actions, refreshing all within the sphere of our influence, begetting in them desires and aspirations for strength and purity, for holiness and peace, and for that joy which brings with it no sorrow. This is the result of an indwelling Savior. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1134. Sunday, August 9. Symbols of God's Word As Christ sat looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom, He told His disciples the story of the ten virgins, by their experience illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before His second coming. The two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. By the lamps is represented the Word of God. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Christ's Object Lessons, page 406. Ever since the fall of man, Christ has been the revealer of truth to the world. By him the incorruptible seed, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, is communicated to men. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. In that first promise spoken to our fallen race in Eden, Christ was sowing the gospel seed. But it is to his personal ministry among men and to the work which he thus established that the parable of the sower especially applies. 
The Word of God is the seed. Every seed has in itself a germinating principle. In it the life of the plant is unfolded. So there is life in God's Word. Christ says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John chapter 6, verse 63. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. John chapter 5, verse 24. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power, the very life of God, by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. He who by faith receives the word is receiving the very life and character of God. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 37 and 38. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. It may be that much work needs to be done in your character building, that you are a rough stone which must be squared and polished before it is fit to fill a place in God's temple. You need not be surprised if with hammer and chisel God cuts away your defects of character until you are prepared to fill the place he has ready for you. No human being can accomplish this work. Only by God can it be done. And be assured that he will not strike one useless blow. His every blow is struck in love for your eternal good and happiness. He knows your infirmities and works to restore, not to destroy. Of the poor fainting soul, tired of looking to humanity only to be betrayed and forgotten, Christ says, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 5 This Day with God, page 23 Monday, August 10 The Creative Power of God's Word the material world is under God's control. The laws that govern all nature are obeyed by nature. Everything speaks and acts the will of the Creator. The clouds, the rain, the dew, the sunshine, the showers, the wind, the storm, all are under the supervision of God and yield implicit obedience to Him who employs them. The tiny spear of grass bursts its way through the earth first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. The Lord uses these, his obedient servants, to do his will. The fruit is first seen in the bud, enclosing the future pear, peach, or apple, and the Lord develops these in their proper season because they do not resist his working. The same creative energy that brought the world into existence is still exerted in upholding the universe and continuing the operations of nature. The hand of God guides the planets in their orderly march through the heavens. It is not because of inherent power that year by year the earth continues her motion round the sun and produces her bounties. The word of God controls the elements. Lift him up, pages 66. And 67. Those who have a true knowledge of God will not become so infatuated with the laws of matter or the operations of nature as to overlook or refuse to acknowledge the continual working of God in nature. Nature is not God, nor was it ever God. The voice of nature testifies of God, but nature is not God. As his created work, it simply bears a testimony to God's power. Deity is the author of nature. The natural world has, in itself, no power but that which God supplies. There is a personal God, the Father. There is a personal Christ, the Son. The psalmist says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 3. Some may suppose that these grand things in the natural world are God. They are not God. All these wonders in the heavens are only doing the work appointed them. They are the Lord's agencies. God is the superintendent as well as the creator of all things. The divine being is engaged in upholding the things that he has created. 
The same hand that holds the mountains and balances them in position guides the worlds in their mysterious march around the sun. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 293 and 294. The revelation of himself that God has given in his word is for our study. This we may seek to understand, but beyond this we are not to penetrate. None are to indulge in speculation regarding his nature. Here, silence is eloquence. The omniscient one is above discussion. The Faith I Live By, page 40. Tuesday, August 11. The Benefits of Studying God's Word The ten holy precepts spoken by Christ upon Sinai's mount were the revelation of the character of God and made known to the world the fact that He had jurisdiction over the whole human heritage. That law of ten precepts of the greatest love that can be presented to man is the voice of God from heaven speaking to the soul in promise, This do, and you will not come under the dominion and control of Satan. There is not a negative in that law, although it may appear thus. The Lord has given His holy commandments to be a wall of protection around His created beings, and those who will keep themselves from the defilement of appetite and passion may become partakers of the divine nature. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1105. It is true that the Apostle, Peter, has said that there are some things that are hard to be understood in the Scriptures. So there are. And if it were not that there are subjects that are difficult and hard to be understood, well might the skeptic who now pleads that God has given a revelation that cannot be understood, well might he, I say, have something else to plead. God's infinity is so much higher than we are, and it is impossible for man to comprehend the mystery of godliness. Angels of God looked with amazement upon Christ who took upon himself the form of man and humbly united his divinity with humanity in order that he might minister to fallen man. It is a marvel among the heavenly angels. God has told us that he did do it, and we are to accept the word of God just as it reads. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 919. From a child, Timothy had known the scriptures. Religion was the atmosphere of his home. The piety of his home life was pure, sensible, and uncorrupted by false sentiments. The word of God was the rule which guided Timothy. He received his instruction line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little and the spiritual power of these lessons kept him pure in speech and free from all corrupting sentiments. His home instructors cooperated with God in educating this young man to bear the burdens that were to come upon him at an early age. The lessons of the Bible have a moral and a religious influence upon the character as they are wrought into the practical life. Timothy learned and practiced these lessons. He had no specially wonderful talents, but his work was valuable because he used his God-given abilities as consecrated gifts in the service of God. His intelligent knowledge of the truth and of experimental piety gave him distinction and influence. The Holy Spirit found in Timothy a mind that could be molded and fashioned to become a temple for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. My Life Today, page 34 Wednesday, August 12 Applying God's Word Christ has made every provision for us to be strong. He has given us His Holy Spirit, whose office is to bring to our remembrance all the promises that Christ has made, that we may have peace and a sweet sense of forgiveness. If we will but keep our eyes fixed on the Savior and trust in His power, we shall be filled with a sense of security, for the righteousness of Christ will become our righteousness. My Life Today, page 45 The scriptures are to be received as God's word to us, not written merely, but spoken. So with all the promises of God's word, 
In them, he is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as if we could listen to his voice. It is in these promises that Christ communicates to us his grace and power. They are leaves from that tree which is for the healing of the nations. Revelation chapter 22 verse 2. Received, assimilated, they are to be the strength of the character, the inspiration and sustenance of the life. Nothing else can have such healing power. Nothing besides can impart the courage and faith which give vital energy to the whole being. The Ministry of Healing, page 122. He who has given his life to God in ministry to his children is linked with him who has all the resources of the universe at his command. His life is bound up by the golden chain of the immutable promises with the life of God. The Lord will not fail him in the hour of suffering and need. My God shall supply all your, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19. And in the hour of final need, the merciful shall find refuge in the mercy of the compassionate Savior and shall be received into everlasting habitations. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 24. By study of the scriptures and earnest prayer, seek to obtain clear conceptions of your duty and then faithfully perform it. It is essential that you cultivate faithfulness in little things, and in so doing, you will acquire habits of integrity in greater responsibilities. Every event of life is great for good or for evil. The mind needs to be trained by daily tests that it may acquire power to stand in any difficult position. In the days of trial and of peril, you will need to be fortified to stand firmly for the right independent of every opposing influence. Jesus consents to bear our burdens only when we trust him. He is saying, Come unto me, all ye weary and heavy laden. Give me your load. Trust me to do the work that it is impossible for the human agent to do. Let us trust him. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But Jesus sees the end from the beginning, and in every difficulty, he has his way prepared to bring relief. Abiding in Christ, we can do all things through him who strengthens us. God's Amazing Grace, page 113. Thursday, August 13. Sharing the Word. When the disciples preached Christ and Him crucified after His resurrection, the authorities commanded them not to speak any more nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They continued to preach the good news of salvation through Christ, and the power of God witnessed to the message. The sick were healed, and thousands were added to the church. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the God of heaven, the mighty ruler of the universe, took this matter into his own hands, for men were warring against his work. He showed them plainly that there is a ruler above man whose authority must be respected. The Lord sent his angel by night to open the prison doors, and he brought forth these men whom God had commissioned to do his work. The ruler said, Speak not at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But the heavenly messenger sent by God said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 713. Christ's messages of mercy were varied to suit his audience. He knew how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. For grace was poured upon his lips that he might convey to men in the most attractive way the treasures of truth. He had tact to meet the prejudiced minds and surprise them with illustrations that won their attention. Through the imagination, he reached the heart. His illustrations were taken from the things of daily life, and although they were simple, they had in them a wonderful depth of meaning. 
the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, the seed, the shepherd, and the sheep. With these objects, Christ illustrated immortal truth, and ever afterward, when his hearers chanced to see these things of nature, they recalled his words. Christ's illustrations constantly repeated his lessons. The Desire of Ages, page 254. True love seeks first the honor of God and the salvation of souls. Those who have this love will not evade the truth to save themselves from the unpleasant results of plain speaking. When souls are in peril, God's ministers will not consider self, but will speak the word given them to speak, refusing to excuse or palliate evil. They are to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. In Christ's stead, they are to labor as stewards of the mysteries of heaven, encouraging the obedient and warning the disobedient. They are not to speak their own words, but words which one greater than the potentates of earth has bidden them speak. Prophets and Kings, pages 141 and 142. For further reading, God's Amazing Grace, For Each Day's Need, page 117, and Evangelism, Bible Work Techniques, pages 481 to 486.